Hey everybody, uh, today I'm very happy to welcome Warren Stewart here. Uh, for me, my mentor, the man, the myth, the legend with awesome news. Warren, how are you doing, man? All good? I'm good. Who's this man, the myth, the legend? I'm looking around, <laughs> but I don't see him. Is he behind me? <laughs> Look, where, where is he? Under the chair. Oh, Eric, yeah, Eric. Eric's on the other side of the camera. <laughs> the man, the myth, and the legend, and the hair. And the hair. Mr. Eric Von Gonzalez, yes. Oh, man. Now, how are you, Addy? I'm doing you great. Good? Great. Every day is good. Every day is exciting. Always news. So, yeah, thank you so much. Speaking of which, what, what country are you in at the moment? I'm at the moment on the Greek island Evia. Oh, oh, I feel so sorry for you. Oh, you it must be just so horrible being on a Greek island. Oh, man. Everybody is I nice. love Greece. Yeah. Oh, I love Greece. Yeah, my, my family, my aunt and uncle have a house on, in, on Rhodos in a village called oh, Lindos, which wow. is, I think, as close to heaven as you're going to get. Gre I love it's Greece amazing. and the islands. Oh. Man, we came in September and somehow six months ago, uh, later, we are still here. We have a guest room. You're in, you're you've been on a Greek... You've been on a Greek island for six months. Whatever. <laughs> oh, what a tough life you live, Andy. A tough what? life. Oh, <laughs> oh. Not just on one, not just on one island. But okay, I, I will tell you another day. <laughs> life is wonderful. Life wonderful. is rough. Yeah, I'm really grateful. And I'm really grateful. Well, congratulations. Yeah. And I'm really grateful yeah. uh, to celebrate this amazing day because you have great news. I do. I've released a book. Dun, dun, dun. Da, da, da. Ooh, looks good. 453 whopping pages of, I mean, it's, it says on the front, it is a studio setup, pre-production, producing, recording, mixing, mastering. It's the home studio recording complete guide. The complete guide to home studio recording. Um, yeah, I'm wow. really blessed, really blessed. This has taken three years to write. Three years. Three years. A lot of research. And if, if it wasn't for Jerry Hammock, I wouldn't have been able to finish it. Jerry has been incredible at taking all of my ideas and discussion points and everything that I've come up with over the last, you know, million decades of doing this and making it all make sense. Jerry has been wonderful. Obviously, he write, he wrote the uh, definitive books on the Beatles recording, and it's yeah. just like where he goes into such detail on everything and so he was the right brain the right person to he is my right brain he's the right brain to my left brain there you go <laughs> um no really was wonderful plus of course you know we're in a unique position because mm -hmm. at produce like a pro we've interviewed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of the world's biggest and best producers engineers mixing mixers mastering engineers we've traveled the world like yourself been to recording studios mm -hmm. everywhere you know and all of that acquired knowledge from all of those wonderful guys and girls and all of those incredible studios and the techniques we've learned and the discussions we had have created this. I mean, we were thinking about this. To write a book like this, if you didn't have Produce Like a Pro and your, and your, your motive wasn't to, you know, bring information to the world, you'd have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars flying around interviewing all these people. So, yeah, I have actually spent hundreds of thousands of dollars doing <laughs> <laughs> but you know we have a youtube channel out of it and now we have a definitive book um we wrote this specifically to be the book on the subject um it's it's ridiculous it's i mean ridiculous. you've seen it uh the the index is is ridiculous <laughs> the big the, uh, index of topics at the back here it is absolutely ridiculous what we cover um and the contents if you go to the front is just crazy and it's full of common sense it's common sense it is it is technical mm -hmm. and it needs to be technical but it's also common sense you know for instance you know if you're building up your studio it's like well what are you going to be recording what are you primarily going to be doing if you're going to be using a lot of virtual instruments like you know get this certain equipment when to buy used when to buy new what plugins, you know, reminding people that they have stock plugins in their DAW, but there's certain things that can really only be achieved by buying third party plugins, you know, common sense discussion, common sense solutions. Um, it's, it's, it's an every man, every woman book. It's written for everybody at whatever level they're at. Um, and like I said, it's not just my brain. 
it's Jerry's as well, and more importantly, it's all of those incredible producers, engineers, mixers, musicians, mastering engineers, studio owners that we've spoken to over the last eight years. So it's a lot of information. It's With incredible. Tons of diagrams. It's talking incredible. Talking about how to set up speakers. You know, yeah, thank you. It, yeah. Yeah. Man. <laughs> Mic I, I, techniques. Mic it, techniques for, <laughs> from mandolin through to orchestra. You know, everything. It's absolutely I, everything. At first, I love your enthusiasm in this because you are doing it for so many years. And for me, this is also inspiration and for many people, like in a positive way, you always have new ideas, something new that you are doing. Like, and after I read this book, I'm like, who else than Juan and Jerry could write this? It's all the knowledge concentrated in such a loving way. I mean, I'm a book nerd. I, when I started, I read every single book. Uh, mixing with your mind, mixing secrets, which is obviously, it's not a secret because you can buy it on Amazon, but, uh, <laughs> 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 and you know, all, all kinds of things, getting all the, the, the IG promotions, like learn mixing with my 20 page books or, and, and stuff like this. After I read your book, it's on the point, the introduction from Jack Douglas, amazing, beautiful. And these are real life tips. There is no book out there covering how to calculate your sessions, how yeah. to prepare your band, how to bond with the yeah. musicians. It's either how to EQ this nasty sound out of the guitar. Every, everyone can learn it in a point. There, there is this technical aspect. But for the first time, I see that the book is covering the human aspect of the production. Ah, oh, thank you. And really, thank you. really, uh, absolutely. And you're also so knowledgeable and the graphics are so helpful from how to set up a patch bay, how patch bay works. It would be thousands of hours of YouTube and searching and finding the right channel and sorting out information, forgetting misinformation and confusion. I think it's solving a lot of things, a lot of problems. And it's just the and perfect And there's photos guide. of Eric in there too, look. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I buy the book. <laughs> That's right. It was just, although he's wearing his beanie in quite a few of these. Eric, ah. you, you, your hair wasn't done properly at the time? I, I, you have to pay more for that. <laughs> oh, so you have to pay more to have pictures of, of, of Eric with his hair out. We looked at everything out there and we just wanted to make sure this was the definitive book. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a lot more coming. There's going to be more stuff based around it. You're going to, there's going to be like audio stuff. There's going to be a lot of things. And, and of course, you know, we, we talked to publishing companies and we realized that self-publishing, it was much smarter because we could be nimble. We can change things up easier. We can add and subtract things. It's just, I wanted this to be the most up-to-date but also taking into account everything that was learned from the past. That's the reason it's great to have Jack Douglas do the forward because he's one of the most successful, one of the, the greatest producers and engineers of all time. And he wrote a beautiful forward. You know what was exciting about it? He said, send me the book. And, and then about three weeks later, he wrote the forward. He's like, I want to read the book first. Wow. So, yeah, so it's not one of those kind of like, just, you know, say something nice and whatever. No, <laughs> the, he really... He really did add some beautiful things to it. Definitely. You can really feel it in the foreword. I have a couple of questions for you, maybe, um, and would read yes. a few quotes that I really, really liked. To give you a sm small sneak peek, like, for example, this is a part from the pre-production chapter that I really enjoyed. Yep. And I like this quote. It is either music so authentic in, ex in its expression that it cannot be ignored, or music that pushes or breaks the rules commonly associated with the primary genre it represents. Either of these approaches separates the wheat from the chaff of artists who compete for the ears of listeners and consumers. I think man, you're speaking from the soul instead of sharing the next hit single formula and do you have to do this to, to sell your music. You encourage creativity. It's huge. I get artists coming to me all the time for, from years of developing artists. And I was blessed. I developed a lot of artists that got signed. Mm -hmm. A lot of those signed artists went on to become very successful. And the, what's great about getting involved in the development process is, is what well, Sandy Robertson, the great Sandy Robertson, one of the, I think, I think the person that invented um, producer management, he said to me, he goes, you've got to crack the code. And then 
when you when you cracked the code, I remember we were playing. He goes, by Jove, Warren, you cracked the code. When you when there's something that sounds like the artist. Now, if a 35 year old singer comes to me and wants to do modern pop music, I'm going to be like, maybe. But you are going to be competing with teenagers, and you're going to be competing with people that are on Disney shows mm-hmm. or reality shows or something. It's like let's sit down. And we're like, maybe maybe they maybe they do have an angle to be modern and pop. Maybe they're a DJ. Maybe they're an EDM artist already, and it's it's okay. It makes sense. Mm-hmm. But quite often you'll sit with an artist like that, and you'll find out there's something in there. There's something, a story, something that makes sense about them that suggests a little bit more of a different genre or a different interpretation of that. Something to be brought into their idea. You know, it happens to me all the time. I remember Sandy Robertson, the great Sandy Robertson, said to me when Avril Lavigne came to him, she came to him as a country artist. What? A country artist. Yep, country artist. Wow. And she was Canadian, and her management team, whoever it was at the time, saw her as being the next Shania Twain. And then he put her with The Matrix he was managing, and The Matrix did this kind of pop punk thing with her mm-hmm. that made perfect sense. And before you know it, she's Avril Lavigne. But initially, the management company saw her as a country pop artist. Now, I'm not saying that she thought of herself like that. I'm, I, I think all that happened is she, she got in a room with some great producers who were able to bring her out, bring out the real artist of what she wanted to be that made it made sense to her. Mm-hmm. And that's a big part of production is not to dictate not to like tell the artist who they should be, but discover who they should be. It seems like her management company didn't know, but she knew and the producers knew and they were able to bring it out of her. And mm. that's a great example. You know, um, it happens all the time. And that is our job. Ultimately, at the end of the day, gun to my head, we're a service industry. As producers, mm-hmm. engineers, mixers, songwriters, co-writers, whatever we might do, we are a service industry. We're there to help the artist. Quincy Jones said it best when he talked about Stevie Wonder, the great Stevie Wonder. There's no accident that Stevie Wonder is represented in every aspect of my <laughs> studio. There's multiple copies of songs in the key of life everywhere because Stevie Wonder mm-hmm. is without a doubt one of the top two or three, depending on one, two or three, what you artists of all time. Yeah. As not only as a songwriter and as a singer, but a multi-instrumentalist, and of course as a producer. He produced his own tracks as well. Songs in the Key of Life is an absolute masterpiece. And Quincy Jones said about Stevie Wonder, he said, Stevie always leaves enough room for God. What he means is he takes his ego out of it and he just lets the creativity roll, the best idea, the best. And that, you know, whether you believe in God or not, that's not the point. The point is leave your ego at the door. We're here to cultivate. I want artists I work with to, yes, I'd love for them to come back to me, Of course. Mm -hmm. But what I've experienced, better still, is when they do come back, they've learned so much from that first song or that first EP or that first album we've done that they come in and their whole songwriting level has just jumped up. And so the first album I do, I might co-write most of the songs, half of the songs. Maybe the second album I come in, I'm doing a little bit of co-writing on two or three songs. Mm -hmm. It's because they don't need my writing as much. They've grown as a writer. And that is a success as a producer. That's what we should be doing. We should be inspiring the artists we work with, not dictating and all this this kind of stuff. Um, Yeah. It's our job to teach them, to help them, to cultivate them. Definitely, definitely. To be, be of service, be with them, walk the path together. And grow yep. together. I think this is just the most yep. beautiful thing in music. I mean, Bob Marley was singing One Love. It's, it's, music is bringing down the barriers. Like everybody can do it. It brings people together. And exactly. This is where the most beautiful things come out from. Yeah, I agree entirely. Absolutely fantastic. Well, I'm so glad that you're enjoying the book. That means a lot. I, I, I love it. It really does. I, it will go, look, I have one tiny shelf in my camper car, but there is space for this book. <laughs> it's it's one of the few books that will come with me. <laughs> well, I, I've got to order the author copies myself. I don't have it. This is the only one I have. Oh, really? And it's uh, <laughs> yeah, and it's got it's got not for resale, not for resale written across the front. Uh, so I've got to order some author copies, mm-hmm. and when I do, so I have to buy them from them. I will send you a signed one. Oh, and I, I mean, I look look lovely. forward Thank to seeing you, you in, a, in a in a couple of weeks. Oh yeah, I'm back uh, in a month. Wonderful. Oh, I suppose in a month. Yeah, yeah, almost in a month. Yep. Yeah. For Nam. Woohoo. Woo.
Let's do it again. Go Nam. <laughs> <laughs> testing some mics <laughs> with thousand people testing, in the back. Testing, testing. <laughs> uh, wow, lovely. I, I always love these conversations. And um, I have, let's see what, what else I've got here. Oh, also from your book, from the pre-production phase. What, what I really liked is, yeah. let's, let's face it, some people go together like bread and butter and others like chalk and cheese. What are some common yes. red flags for you? <laughs> What, what would you say? For like, me? Yeah, like red flags that... that um... Well, I think it all, it all starts with that initial, with that initial contact. Um, if somebody, when somebody emails me, I get emails every day for people that want to work with me. And um, I'm obviously in a very blessed position now in my life where I don't say yes to many projects. I choose what I want to work on and I make sure that I'm really excited to work with that person. And probably more importantly, that they're really excited to work with me. Mm -hmm. You know, if an artist writes to me and, uh, and, and immediately wants to talk about money, then I'm just thinking they're just trying to find somebody at a certain budget. I want to talk about music. I want to know about the music. So whenever somebody writes to me and says, hey, I've got a song that I want mixed or I've got a song or an album or an EP that want, I want you to produce, um, I go, great, send me some demos. And if they're like, well, I'm still writing, I'm like, okay, come back to me when you've written some songs and you want me to hear. I don't start wasting my time. It doesn't make sense. We're so busy. Um, why would I start quoting on things I haven't even heard yet? And, but more importantly, I want to hear something that I can talk about. And so once they got to a stage where they got some demos and they send it to me, I can then make a plan about what I would do, how much work needs to be done on this. It makes life a lot easier when you're quoting something. Having a one-size-fits-all price makes no sense. I remember, for instance, you know, working with, with famous mixers and I would produce an album and then they would quote, like, you know, back in the day, like $7,500 a song. And that included the three vocal acoustic songs. Gotcha. Wow. Yeah. And I just remember thinking, okay, I get it. This song might take you five hours to do because it's got a full band and there's an orchestra on it. Maybe it'll take you a day. But really, you're going to charge $7,500 for the three vocal acoustic ones? You, you know, it just became really kind of silly. You know, that, that left a bad taste in my mouth and it made me realize that, you know, what it's like to be an artist. For an artist, we want this to be, um, you know, We want somebody to care about our music. And that is the most important thing. Before you start any kind of pre-production, you want to hear the music. You've got to get, get inside the songs. And for me also, I can't produce unless I have a vision. You know, and I think one of the biggest things that's leveled at modern production is the kind of kitchen sink kind of mentality when people just cut recording parts and adding it. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly production is meaningless and it all becomes about the mixer's the style, meaning the mixer becomes an editor starts muting things and flying things around that don't work here but might work over there. And, and that makes no sense to me. You know, the greatest album songs in the key of life, you know, Revolver, Pet Sounds, uh, uh, what's going, you know, what's going on, uh, Axis Boulder's Love, you know, uh, Miles Davis, you know, Kind of Blue, all of those are done in production and in the arrangements of the songs. So... You know, I, I know a kind of blue, I think it doesn't exist in anything other than a two track. But my point is, is like, even if you could recall those multi tracks of those kind of classic albums, some of which were recorded on four tracks, you know, it's committed. Ideas, arrangements are committed. So I'm not saying that mixing can't change things. Of course it can. But the idea of just keep recording guitar parts until you, the mixer figures it out later makes no sense to me. So that's a lack of vision, that's a lack of production, it's a lack of arrangement. And so that kind of stuff comes out in the pre-production process. You know what to produce. You know the vision you're going to have by sitting there inside of the song. If you can, and you're not doing it remotely, having the artist sitting opposite you with an acoustic guitar, with a piano, with whatever the chosen instrument. Maybe they're a singer and a songwriter but they don't really play an instrument to a high level. So you're taking care of that. Or maybe you have to hire somebody else. All of these things are important, but that's the stage where you get to really understand the artist, get to get inside those songs, get inside their art, get to really know what they're trying to say. And sometimes it's peripheral kind of love song stuff. Sometimes you think it's a peripheral love song and then you get to know them and you realize, wow, 
I remember working with an artist years ago that uh, that told me that they had written this song. Um, it was like a love song, and it wasn't a, like a love song to a spouse or a girlfriend or a boyfriend. It wasn't. It wasn't that kind of love. It was love for a, a family member that was like a mentor to them, and it was like. Oh, there's so much more. You know, I get that. I'm sure you all do. My aunt and uncle, my dad's uh, sister and 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 her husband are two of the most important people in my life. They've helped shape me. They've helped drive me along. My dad's father, my grandfather, you know, I you can write songs of love for those people that that have so much more going on than just like, "Ooh, baby, I love you." You know. So that's hard to really get into if you're just kind of like copying a production or throwing the kitchen sink at it, you know? So pre-production is super, super important to me. I love that you brought that up and mentioned it because it's a very, very important part. And it can be done remotely. I've done tons of pre-production remotely. I, I suggest ideas and then they email stuff and I listen to it and I make notes and send it back. And you can get on Zoom calls, obviously, or Skype calls and and do so much more these days than than, you know, you're used to. And it's amazing. I've had whole pre-production sessions spent over like two or three months of doing like once or twice a week over two or three months. And by the time they get here, we just sit down with acoustic guitars and finalize a few things, make sure that the tempo is right. You know, a couple of minor tweaks and boom, we're in making a record. So amazing. It's a, it's, a beautiful, it's a beautiful time to be making music, my friend. So cool. Yeah. Look at you, you're traveling the world. You're currently in Greece for the last six months. <laughs> I feel so sorry for you. Oh. It's oh. <laughs> all that, all that delicious food oh and, my and wonder, wonderful mm. people and incredible uh, views. Oh. And when you walk down to the beach every day, oh, you must really suck. <laughs> and all that history. Oh, oh, oh my gosh, Athens is full. So, I feel it. so sorry for you. It's it's so it's so amazing, man. Hey, I'm so grateful for this times. Really, where you're saying it because I. I'm having this studio in the car and the first month we spent in a refugee camp and we transformed a, a, a big wooden dome into a record studio and could produce music wow. for a month together with all the people wow, there amazing. from every country. And, you know, amazing. such a beautiful experience that people can process what they experienced. Um, the project is called Habibi Works and it was such a blessing where I thought again, man, I have this tiny interface here, I have a microphone, hey, we can make music, put up the laptop, yeah. and you're able to do it. And and this is why, why I love the book so much, in because Greece. it's up to the, in Greece, in Ioannina it was, man. it was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love well, it there. I'm very happy for you, you deserve it. Thank you, my friend, thank you. I have one last quote here. If you're familiar with his song, Superstition, you, you will know that the track was re recorded with only four elements. A clavichord, a synth bass, a drum, and the trumpet section. Well, I mean, the thing about the clavinet, if you've heard, if you've heard the clavinets, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, I, I'd have to recall the track here to be exact, but I feel like there's three, four, or five of them. Yeah, he layered there's them. There's definitely huh? multiple clavinets. Yeah, yeah, he layered them. He's got one that's really heavily affected. You know, it's the thing that. That's a really good song to talk about because if you take any, if you take a couple of the elements and solo them, it's quite chaotic. Like some of those drum fills are insane. Like, <laughs> and, and, and you play it in solo, you're like, what the heck was that? You put it in the track, it's it's music, it's unbelievable. My point is, is like the groove and the feel of that track was built up because he played the drums on it as well, um, very differently than having a band in a room. Um, so it has such a unique, incredible feel. Um, and it just goes to prove things don't have to be done any particular way. There is no rules. And you can get amazing results working lots of different ways. And that's what the book is super important to me because it doesn't just teach one method. One of the biggest things I, I, I come up against uh, uh, online is people saying, oh, you're wrong about something and you go, well, actually you're wrong if you only do this idea. You're right if you do that one. It, there's so many ways to do it. You, you can you can hire a Victor Andrizzo and have him play on a track and give you the best drum feel you've ever heard. Or you can program it with a, with a 
with a drum machine or you know any modern uh, virtual drum instrument, whatever you want to use, and have a different approach. And it can be just as good, but in a different way. It doesn't make one better than the other. What is it that the artist requires? What does the song require? As Quincy Jones always says, the song, the song, and the song. And if the song is amazing, it can lead you in different directions. And But the song will always drive it with, of course, the artist, you know, really giving it an individual twist. I've, I've talked about this many times before, but I, I was working with an artist who was signed, I think, to RCA at the time. And they played me a new song they had just done with a different producer and said, my label think this song is a hit. And they played me the song and I was like, it's really good. It's really good. And, and I never try to be ne negative. And I, and I also am very aware that one producer criticizing another is just so freaking, you know, it's like all the forums online. So I didn't, didn't want to be that guy. But I was like, I listened to it and I was like, I don't know. I don't know. It's a good song. I don't know if it's a hit. So they said, well, um, here's the demo. And it was a song that was written by Cara de Guardi. And they played me the original demo. And the, the, the production was Rora, was more energetic, and the vocal was amazing. The vocal was probably responding to the incredibly raw, energetic production. And it was a hit. It was a hit. So I said to her, I was like, you've got to recut this. You know, and I wasn't trying to get the gig. I was like, you've got to go back to the producer and you've got to recut it. Listen to that demo. It has all this fire and passion. And the vocal's like passionate and the track is like raw and energetic. That's what the song is amazing. But the way it was produced and the vocal performance made it a hit. The way that she had worked with this other producer, it got very safe and very boring. And it was just, you know, and the vocal was good. It was a good vocal, but it wasn't a great, you know, like rip your soul apart vocal that would have happened if she had been motivated and the track had been better. So, you know, and sometimes better means not as good, not as polished. And this is where we 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 get very, very lost and all the stuff that I try to talk about in the book. And I try to preach, I hate the word preach, but I just use it. I try to really, I really try to talk about on, on, the, on YouTube and stuff is like, people will say to me very occasionally, they'll email me and go, you know, I downloaded your tracks, but there was a digital pop or or there was a, a low-end issue with one of these things. So, yes, so often people, you know, point to me and say, oh, you know, I downloaded the multi-tracks to sound really good, but in this one bar here, there was a digital pop, or in this other bar, it was, like, too much low-end. And it's like, I, I totally get it. However, you know, it's not going to affect the ultimate result, and some of the best and the greatest performances of all time have tons of issues with them. And it's all about performance, all about capturing an energy, capturing, as, you know, Sandy Robertson said, cracking the code. And if you can do all of those things, you know, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't learn how to record great. Of course, you want to record extremely well. But at the end of the day, having the right mic is not as important as having a mic. <laughs> you know, if an artist, if an artist is, is ready to record and you're like, wait there, hold on a second. I really feel like Hmm, this could be, I'm not sure, let's, let's, let's go and test 14 different mic pre's and decide. Yeah. So there's a lot of that, a lot of like what, you know, talking mm -hmm. about equipment mm -hmm. that can do the job for you. I mean, we talk about everything. We talk about, we talk about um, you know, ribbon mics, dynamic mics, condenser mics. Um, we talk about um, different speakers, different headphones, different pieces of equipment, everything in here, cover all the bases, audio interfaces, different connectivity types. I mean, you can how to position microphones and equipment and the importance of repeatable workflow, optimizing your studio, studio roles, the producer, optimizing your mixing workflow, optimizing your recording workflow. Um, the Shelly Yakas is quoted here. Richard Dodd, I, I mean, you name it. There's our good wow. friend, uh, producer Dave Jordan, at, actually working oh, at my he's studio. The best I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's a blessing. It's a blessing. Such a Andy, blessing. thanks ever so much for having me on your channel. I really, really appreciate it. And please, everyone, check out the book. It's it's three years, but it's not really three years. It's a lifetime of work has gone into this. A lifetime of work. That's amazing. We're going to put the link down in the description. You can get the book right now. It's out right now. And um, please get this book. It's the perfect merge between technical knowledge, human and interpersonal skills right. and creativity. And I think there is no other book out there that really merge all of these topics. 
So thank you very much, Juan, for your time. I always appreciate it. And see you very soon. Man. Thanks ever so much. You rock. Thanks, Addy. So long, farewell, la vida, say au revoir. <laughs> Adios, tuzines, ciao, tschüss, goodbye. Bye. Bye.